Hi guys, so today I'm finishing the opera and you're going to hang out with me while I do it. I'm going to try and do something a bit different today because I've been conscious that I've not really shown you my actual composing. I've talked a lot about composing and I've done other things in the vlog. I think I have this kind of instinctual feeling that you seeing me compose is boring, <laughs> which it is, <laughs> but let's try and do something boring. Um, we're all so obsessed with making everything interesting on the internet, so why don't we have something that's a bit boring? I think rather than like making this like a super, super sort of vloggy vlog or a super kind of like me trying to entertain you guys, I just think we'll spend the next five minutes hanging out together and keep it chilled out. I've got to finish this piece and I'm really close to the end. Um, and I'm just going to talk to you a bit about it. So I've mentioned this piece before in the vlog. It is um, a reworking of The Beggar's Opera by John Gay, which was written in the 18th century. It dates from 1728 and uh, the reason I'm doing a reworking of it is the opera that I'm writing has been commissioned by the German school London, who are based in Richmond. And John Gay actually wrote the Beggar's Opera on the site of where the German school London now is. So when I was talking to the school about doing a project together, the kind of obvious idea really was to write a piece based on the Beggar's Opera. And of course the Beggar's Opera has been reworked by lots of other people as well. So most famously, um, Bertolt Brecht um, and Kurt Weill uh, Die Drei Groschen Oper, which is the um, Thrapani Opera, is the, uh, the English translation. Brecht's version is a fairly loose reworking of a John Gay, but it does have quite a lot of material in it. Um, but other people have done reworkings. Um, what else can I show you? Getting on for 20 years ago now, uh, Nick Deere did this, the Villains Opera, updating it to modern London. Uh, there's other versions as well. If you look on the Wikipedia page, you'll see there's quite a few. And like a lot of my projects, I'm writing the words as well as the music. So it's a 90 minute stage work, uh, two acts with an interval, so it's a full evening's entertainment. And it is a play with songs in. So you could say it's a musical. Uh, I'm calling it a music theatre. So I see it as being somewhere between music theatre, opera, musical. The Beggar's Opera was arguably the first ever musical because it was the first time someone really did a play in English with songs thrown in in the middle. And at the time in London, 1720s London, the big kind of entertainment that people would go to was Handel's Opera, right, which was Italian opera. It was all sung in Italian. It was largely performed by Italians. Castrati, lots of Italian violinists over in London in the orchestra. Uh, it was seen as a very kind of foreign thing. And um, because it was foreign, it was seen as a bit sexy and a bit kind of cool, but also so people kind of laughed at it and sort of made fun of these effeminates as they saw them uh, effeminate Italian musicians. So the Beggar's Opera was kind of a uh, sort of almost anti-European piece. It was uh, poking fun at opera. John Gay has lots of things in it which satirise the conventions of opera. So for example, Polly and Lucy, if you know the Beggar's Opera or um, the Thrapani Opera, Polly and Lucy are these two female characters who are both sort of in love with Macheath, who's the kind of, sort of villain stroke anti-villain of the piece. He's not a very good villain. And uh, they have a kind of feud thing and it kind of echoes the sort of two female feuding characters that you would get in, in Italian opera with lots of histrionics and stuff. One of the things that John Gay does in this, which uh, Brecht doesn't take up, is that um, there's a kind of postmodern aspect to it, which is that the opera starts with the beggar uh, and the player. Let's go and have a look at it. So it's got this introduction, and the beggar says, he basically explains that he's a jobbing writer, which is what John Gay was. Job this is really kind of the very early days of freelance. Um, art, I guess. Handel Opera was kind of a commercial operation in London. This really was was quite a kind of new thing. And, and similarly, you know, John Gay was a freelance writer. That sort of thing really hadn't been happening so much um, before then. So he comes on stage and says he's written this Beggar's Opera and the player is going to be the actor in it. And they have a little chat about it. At the end of the opera, uh, it's all gone pear-shaped basically. So McHeath gets betrayed uh, goes to prison, he escapes from prison, but then he gets betrayed again and goes back to prison. So it's all very sort of silly and comic. Um, but the ending, he's about to get hanged and uh, the beggar and the player reappear. So the player says, but honest friend, I hope you don't intend that McHeath should really be executed. And the beggar says, yes, definitely, basically. And the player says, um, the catastrophe is manifestly wrong for an opera must end happily. 
beggar, your objection, sir, is very just and is easily removed. So then we go back to the opera and the opera ends happily. There's this kind of completely absurd, what you call a deus ex machina, so like a kind of absurd, unexplained intervention from outside. It's a completely absurd ending and there's this sort of postmodern thing of the beggar appearing and uh, changing the ending that he's writing. So I've kind of taken that concept of the beggar uh, and run with it in my opera. So the beggar's part, it's quite small in the John Gay, but in mine it's been expanded. And the beggar is this kind of South London wheeler dealer composer type. And he's got this m mate of his. And they're writing this opera and they've got this urgent deadline to write. And um, it cuts between the beggar as he is in my version, he's called Spivvy. Spivvy and Trout of the two South London writers. It cuts between them desperately trying to write this opera and then we see bits of the opera that they're writing. Do you guys write words as well as music? I mean, in the classical contemporary music world, which I'm in, it's very rare for people to write their own words. And, it, and when you think about that, that's quite bizarre because a lot of musicians, um, a lot of people who write music in other genres, writing words is as much a big part of what they do as writing the music, right? I mean, you know, for example, if you're a singer-songwriter, you wouldn't think two seconds about writing your words as well as your music. And I, I don't claim to be an amazing writer, but I think I've got quite a clear idea of what I want to do with this. And um, I've been working up to this as well. So like my other children's operas that I've written, they've been quite a bit shorter than this. So this is the first time I've done a full kind of 90 minute stage work. But I think because I've done a number of those kind of quite short, uh, like the lion operas are quite short. Um, that's helped me kind of be prepared for this. I don't know, has this been interesting at all? <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I do these vlogs, I'm trying out different things. I'm, I'm really interested to hear you guys say what you find useful. Like, let me know in the comments, like, was this useful? Was it interesting? What would you like to see more of? Would you like me to do more sessions like this where I'm at my desk and I'm working and just sort of chatting to you about what I'm doing? Or what do you, or do you find helpful? I like, the whole point of this YouTube, as I said before, is to be useful for people who are interested in composing, interested in creative stuff, you know, like your writing maybe, or making art or whatever. Or if you're thinking about going into the music business, seeing what it's like doing the business of being a composer. So if, you, if there's anything you'd like to see in my life, then I'm very happy to show it to you. But um, one of the great things about YouTube, I think, is that there's this, this possibility of interaction. It's not just me broadcasting stuff. Uh, you can really shape this channel. So let me know if you've got any ideas of what you'd like to see. And if you haven't already subscribed, then do subscribe to the channel because I do one of these vlogs every Sunday night. And I guess I'll see you next week. Bye.